questions that are being asked I'd like to mostly address, so this is my preference, is questions that affect how you walk. Questions about living this out. What he's always told me is, tell them that if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they'll be where they're supposed to be. But you need a teacher to teach you what it is you need to be doing. All right, next question. We'll get one more. Okay, this one is from Catherine Dime. She says, hello, Rabbi, I have a question regarding frankincense. My brother gifted me a bottle of this oil. Is it forbidden for us to use? I cannot recall a teaching on this topic. Thank you. Okay, so I guess this question fits in with the Torah portion where we talked about you know, the making of the anointed oil and the incense and those kind of things. So the special mixture you're not supposed to make, that one particular mixture. Frankincense is perfectly okay to use. And actually, it's funny, when they sent the question, they mentioned a particular brand of it. It doesn't matter who makes the frankincense. I'm just saying is, you know, it's a very powerful essential oil, okay? Medicinally, very powerful. They're actually giving it to stage three and four cancer patients, two drops in the mouth several times a day, and they're finding that it's getting some powerful results, all right? Okay? You could take some and put it on an age spot, and over, over time, it actually makes that go away. I mean, it's a very powerful thing. Now, so I'm not saying just take a few drops, put it in your mouth. It doesn't taste great. It doesn't taste terrible, but it's got its own interesting flavor to it. Okay. But yes, frankincense, myrrh, all these other, you know, essential oils and herbs are very powerful and they're used medicinally all over the world. Look, when they came to Yeshua, what did they bring him? Frankincense, myrrh, and probably turmeric. Because uh, that was known as the golden spice because of the color, okay? It's this golden, bright golden yellow, all right? So these are, by the way, we now, it's like an obsession all over. Everybody's trying to get curcumin, which is the beneficial chemical out of the turmeric. So now it's the rage now. Everybody wants to take turmeric. And it's a great anti-inflammatory and all these other wonderful things. And frankincense also has its powerful place in the mix, so does oregano, so does a lot of different oils that you could use or herbs you could use, okay? So what I would do before using any of these things is I do a lot of research to understand how they're used, so use them properly, okay? I mean, you might hear that somebody took oregano oil for something, this and that. You don't want to put that in your mouth, okay? You also don't want to just put it raw on your skin unless you want your skin to get real red because it will generate some heat quick, all right? It's a powerful powerful oil, all right? My son, when he was very, very little, had a fever and a, I don't know, probably the flu of some sort, and it was all in his chest, and I took, I put, took some oregano oil and put it right on his chest, and he was a little bit, he didn't even start crying about it. But when I took my hand off, it was all, it really, the heat had really gotten all red, and, um, but it really took care of it like pretty much in a day. Okay, so some of these things really do work well. So yes, you're welcome to do that. All right, on the iPad here, let's see, we've got, uh, who's that, Annabelle? Yeah. Okay. Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Hi, Annabelle. Shabbat Shalom. How do I respond when um, someone tells me that I need to get married? And you say, you tell, them, you tell them mind their own business. <laughs> Yes, I know that we've had the conversation in counseling where you have told me that uh, it's going to take a strong man in order for me to um, decide to get married. But I see Mary Magdalene and she was not married, of course. Um, she was a strong follower. So... Could Look, I, I've, I've already, I've already answered the question for you. Look, you've you got to not let anybody influence the things you have to make for yourself as choices, okay? And that's why I said, literally, you should tell somebody, mind your own business, all right? Marriage, let me... The number one thing that everybody struggles with that calls us is finances and marriage, okay? And usually they're linked together. Why would the thing that most people struggle with the most, should anybody tell you you should, like, force you into that if you're not interested in that? Okay, 
If the right person comes around, maybe you'll decide you want to get married, maybe you won't, okay? But the thing is, nobody should be saying, well, you know, you should be married. And I would say, well, you know, you should shut up. <laughs> okay, you mind your own business. I mean, I, I just don't understand. And why would you entertain that, okay? I mean, what authority do they have to tell you, well, you know, you should be married? You know. And so, we got a lot of, a lot of people like to stick their nose where it doesn't belong. So, no, you are welcome to stay single. Paul says that. Look, you know, it's great to be single. And if you, if, if you got a problem with your, sort of your, your, your passions, and then maybe it's better for you to get married. But either choice is fine, Okay. But nobody should be pushing you in either direction. Hi, thank you. You're welcome. Same thing, by the way, let me take what Annabelle said and I'm gonna extrapolate that out. If you're younger and you, and you did get finally married, whatever finally means, like you get married and you're still at the age where you can have children, anybody tells you, well, when are you having a baby? Tell them to shut up too. I mean, these are all things they are not going to have to deal with. You get married, they're not gonna deal with your husband. You're gonna have to deal with them. Or if you're a man, they're not going to have to deal with your wife. You're going to have to. And if you end up having children, that's going to be your problem, not theirs. So why would you let somebody push that on you? Right? I mean, it makes no sense at all. You've got to be quick to say, I'm sorry, but that's really none of your business. Okay? All right? If I feel like I want to get married and I feel like Abba's provided me with somebody, I'll get married. Or if I don't, I don't. Okay, so none of you needs to say a word to my daughter about when she's having a baby. She'll have a baby anytime she wants to have a baby. Okay? And I, because, and, you know, we need to just, don't you have enough to deal with on yourself? I mean, we got a lot of busybodies out there. All right? Anyway, I feel like all those people that when they stick their nose out where it doesn't belong need to have a little nose smack. You know, just go up to him and go, bang. They'll be like, what did you do that for? Because you're sticking your nose where it doesn't belong. <laughs> That's why. All right. I don't have anybody else on the pad here. So I can bring Brianna back up with more. Come on. Rob, uh, Rob and John, do you guys have anything on the live stream that they didn't want to do on Zoom? You got two or three? All right. We might get to that after Brianna. All right. Something funny is I was checking the group and yeah. there was one posted like during this. So I think they think they know that we're doing it. That's fine. So I guess I'll do theirs. Sure. Okay. It's Shabbat related. I'm sure you've talked about this, but Gloria Douglas, can you clarify kindling on the Shabbat? Is cooking on the Shabbat included in that as a command? Can I just refer them to last night's Torah study? <laughs> Didn't I explain that enough last night, right? All right. So I'll explain it real quickly here, but really, go to the timestamp for last night. Okay, well, that was the, what is that? What was last night? The, uh, the 8th, right? So just go to March 8th, Torah study. Scroll out, you know, go past all of the slideshow and everything that Rebison did to where I'm talking, and I answer this question. All right, so kindling a fire on the Shabbat. That verse is referring specifically to, well, actually, the context of it is it's situated in the middle of instructions about how to build a tabernacle, and then when they're building the tabernacle. But the point being, don't do fires for work during Shabbat. Don't do fires for cooking during Shabbat, because you also have a verse that says don't cook. They did have fires, even on Shabbat, when they were freezing in the winter. Oh, but they lived in the desert. Go to the desert in the winter, see how cold it gets at night. Okay? It can get real cold. And so just keep that in mind, okay? So no, it doesn't mean you can't turn on your light switch. or like, The Orthodox and the Jews, they, they have the Talmudic stuff that they do, like all the 39 things you can't do on Shabbat and everything else. That's what they came up with. But you know where they got the 39 things from? The work that was necessary to do to build the tabernacle. So they understood, even on some level, when they started trying to figure out the things you can't do on Shabbat, it had to do with things that had to do with building the tabernacle. Okay? So you're not going to dye anything. You're not going to smelt anything. You're not going to cut and measure wood for anything. You're not going right? to weave and do other things for clothing. Okay? You know, they took it out to even more things. Like, you're not going to sort through things to find the things that you want. So you're not sorting through things. These are all the rules they came up with. 
And I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying they, they, they extrapolated them out from there. But the kindling of fire misses the point. And the way I expressed it last night was the pillar of, of fire was not warming them up, okay? Because that fire, to warm up a several square mile camp, okay, of two or three million people, all right? Look, we live in Cleveland, Tennessee. Cleveland, Tennessee is 45,000 people, something like that. Think of the space we take up. I know we're not very densely packed in, but try to put two to three million people into a space with tents and everything else. How much space would that take? So how hot would a fire have to be to get everybody warm enough, and by the way, turn to toast the people closest to it? Let me just think about it, right? For the people on the outer edge of the camp from wherever, the opposite side of wherever the fire is, because the fire is either on one side of the camp or the other, it's in the middle. If it's in the middle, yeah, it's less distance to the outer edges, but the people right in the middle are all gonna get that heat. So no, the scripture doesn't say you can't, you know, turn on your, your heat in the winter so that you can stay warm, okay? But we're not cooking, because it specifically tells you not to cook, and we're not, okay, doing work fires, okay? So we're not gonna do anything that you would normally need a fire for work. Now, most of us don't need a fire for most of the jobs that we do. Okay, but still, that's the concept of it. Okay, more thoroughly explained or just more of the same thing I just gave you anyway last night. Okay, one more. Okay. A lot of these I feel like you've explained before, but I guess I can give them the exact link in this video. Okay. Um, this one is a very common question. Chrissy Marie is asking, can women wear seat seats? Okay, good question. All right, so women in seat seat. Boy. I'm surprised that question came up. That's never been an issue here. Some of you have been around long enough to know it became a big issue here a couple years back. All right, look. The issue, by the way, wasn't whether or not women should wear them. The issue was, the issue was whether or not I would force them to, which, by the way, I don't force the men to. Okay? Men, is there anybody in this room that I ever asked you where your seat seat are? No. Never. Okay? And by the way, I never look to check to see if you're wearing them or not. Because that's your job between you and him. That's not me, okay? So I don't like check everybody to make sure they're wearing a seat seat. So let's deal with commandments. There are two forms of commandments. There's a positive commandment, which is an instruction to do something. And there's a negative commandment. It's not really not negative, but it's a, a commandment to not do something. Do not do this. Do not do that, right? Okay. There are zero women do not wear seat seat commandments. Okay? There is one, women are not to wear that which is pertaining to a man. It doesn't really tell us what that is, though. Could be seat seat. A couple of verses later, it actually mentions seat seat. Not necessarily connected to that, but it's the same chapter a couple of verses later. By couple, I mean like four or five. It's not really far away. Okay? So there is something there. Now, what about the, the instruction to wear them in Numbers 15? It says, speak to the children of Israel and let them know that they need to wear these seats. Well, after all, the children of Israel means everybody. Maybe, okay? Look, a lot of the speaking to the children of Israel included instruction given to Moses to give Israel, all of them, speak to the children of Israel and tell the women what to do when they have their births. And tell the women what to do. And what, oh, by the way, tell the priest to do this and do that. Well, that's not for everybody, okay? But everybody needed to be aware of it. The word for children of Israel is a plural form of sons or sons of Israel, but could include the women. As a matter of fact, you have a room full of women, stick one man in there, the language changes it to masculine. Okay? Even though it's all women in the room, but one guy. All right? So the plural that could include only the men or both is going to be the same word, right? So it doesn't say that. But we do have to understand is we can then look at the history. Historically, the men wore them, okay? With very rare exceptions, all right? So would I stop a woman from wearing them? Absolutely not. Will I insist that you wear them? Absolutely not. Because <laughs> I'm not convinced either way with that, okay? Now for the men, if you ask me, I will insist that you wear them. Of course, you shouldn't be wearing them unless you're covenanted because it's basically a sign that you're covenanted. It's a reminder to keep the covenant you made, to obey the commandments, right? This is a sign to remind you to guard and keep his commandments. 
Okay, so you should be wearing them. By the way, for all of you out there watching, if the person speaking at the microphone that you're listening to that thinks he knows so much about Torah isn't wearing these, stop listening to him. Okay, why do you listen to somebody who's not wearing tzitzit? That doesn't mean you should listen to everybody that wears them, but why would you listen to anybody who doesn't? Okay, I, it's a simple enough command to have tzitzit and to wear them. Okay, and so... You know, I know the camera doesn't always cut where you can see mine, but I have them on, I promise you, every day. Every day. Not just every Shabbat, every day. Even when I never leave the house. Every day. All day. Okay? So bear, bear that in mind, okay? So, now, so again, ladies, you can wear them. Men, you should wear them. I mean, it's a requirement, it's a commandment, okay? And then the last piece of that would be, and if you are gonna wear them, Let's not just think we could do whatever we want and turn them into like a fashion statement, okay? White with one techelet. That's what scripture says. Asked a lady one time, why are you wearing yours with yellow and orange and red? Well, because scripture says I can do whatever I want with the other ones as long as one of them's blue. That's not what the verse says. It says you're gonna go ahead and take strings and put them in the corner of the garment and make one blue. Now you see, you're thinking you can go over to like, you know, Hobby Lobby or Michaels or something and there's like five million colors of string you can get. And so, okay, great. So you can just, and it's, it's same price and whatever. Did you, go, if those of you who didn't watch last night, go watch last night and listen to Revson talk about what it took to dye something, okay? These little bugs that had the red color that made the, the, the red cloth, 70,000 of them to make a pound of dye. So no, they weren't just dyeing everything any color they wanted. They, they found the, white, the whitest string that they could get, the whitest wool that they would just get naturally, okay? And they would dye one the techelet color. I mean, that stuff was expensive. Do you remember there was a, a lady in scripture that was a, a seller of purple, Lydia? She was wealthy. Because that was expensive stuff. And you could, if you could get that produced and then, and then make it and sell it, Okay, because it was a big deal, the process to dye something, all right? Okay, some of you are thinking, no, it's an easy process. Just have a, you know, a eight month old try to eat. It'll dye everything, <laughs> all kinds of colors. No, seriously, all right? White with one techelet, one blue, okay? And don't put stuff in your seat seat. I got this one lady years ago saw that we had a, a website and said, and a marketplace was like, hey, would you consider selling my seat seat? And I said, well, you know, let me see your stuff. So, so she had a Facebook page called Bling Your Fringe. <laughs> Bling Your Fringe. Um, I, I emailed back and said, you and I don't wear them for the same reason. You think you do, but you don't. I don't wear them for what they look like. I don't care if Abba told us to make them puke brown and green. I would wear them with everything I wear, even if they clashed terribly. Matter of fact, he probably should have. That way you would have no excuse. Okay? Except the white and the blue tells a story. All right? Which I tell in the teaching, the armor of Elohim. Okay? So that's from Ephesians 6. I have, I, you have that. All right? Now, I mean, after all, think about it. We're supposed to be looking at these reminders to keep the commandments, right? So you got your strings, and so they're white because we're supposed to be pure and set apart. So that's our goal, to be white. The bride had made herself ready, is wearing all white. And then what's with the blue? Well, even the Jews understand it to represent Mashiach, okay? That it's a royal color. I mean, you have two royal colors, really, the, the, the blue and you have the purple, okay, for royalty. So this is the blue. And so you being blemished and imperfect in your whiteness, in your, right, not being so pure, you are wrapped around by the Mashiach, by the blue. What a message. You don't get that message with rainbow colored seed seed, okay? Oh, but they don't match my dress. Well, ladies, I didn't even say you needed to be wearing them anyway. You need to be around men that are wearing them. Because this is the other thing I love. 
Well, I wear my seat seat inside because I don't need, you know, I don't, I'm too embarrassed for people to see it. Or I really am not wearing them. I'm just going to lie to you and say I'm wearing them inside. Uh, the value of them community-wise is for them to be where everybody could see them. Because if they're a reminder of your covenant and keeping commandments, you're wearing yours for me. I can't, see, I can see mine easily in the monitor here. That's how I can see when you see me pulling for them because I'm looking in the monitor. So I see what the live stream is seeing. But really, for me to see my seat seat, I've got to turn my head and look down to see them. But if you're standing in front of me in my peripheral vision, I can see the seat seat. If, I, if all the men are wearing them, I can see them everywhere I turn. There's a reminder about commandments. So we wear them for others more than we wear them for ourselves. I know the verse doesn't say that, but remember the verse was given to them in a community context. So when it says for you to remember, okay, yeah, you're supposed to remember, but also I get to see yours easier than mine, so it reminds me too. And as there's 20 of you in the room, I got 20 reminders and not just my one, which I can't even see easily anyway, because I got to turn and angle my head and look down. Now, of course, I can reach down and grab them and know they're there. So that's, that kind of is helpful, okay? Uh, Dion. Okay, I don't know how, how, how to ask this question. I just remember um, sometime in the past, you, me- you saying something about if you have an issue in your home and you have to hire a contractor or a plumber or something to come and fix your issue, that um, we can't really schedule when they come to do the work in your house. Um, that it uh, can be done on a Shabbat, if my memory serves me correct. Well, my, my situation is similar to where I'm going to need um, a little bit of help from my family to get certain um, items out of my house that I can't um, get out because I'm trying to put my house on the market. Um, and my, my, I told my mom, no, that it has to be on Sunday because um, I, you know, she not, understands my faith, but she wanted me to ask, Anyway, so that's why I'm asking now if um, her and my daughter want to come up on Shabbat and work on the stuff that my daughter has in the house, can um, I allow them to do that? All right, that was kind of, a, kind of a circuitous question, but you did say you weren't sure how to ask it. Okay, look, here's the thing, all right? Anything that can be avoided on Shabbat should. And so what I mean is, if I'm asking for a contractor, let's go to the first part of what you said, like using what I said in the past as an example. I just want to clarify that. If I'm hiring a contractor to fix a toilet or to fix a sink or to fix a shower, that's an item that should be done in a day or two, whatever, I can make sure that's scheduled not on Shabbat. If a vendor won't do it that way, I'll find another vendor, okay? However, what I said is if you are giving, if, I, if I'm going to move out of my house and let them renovate and redo my house or redo the whole, remodel something, okay, and I'm not going to be there because then I'm allowing them to do that on their schedule. I'm not, I'm not responsible for them doing Shabbat or not, okay? So we're talking about when you're giving them a, a larger window of time and they're going to fit it in wherever they fit it in. But if you're doing something that's in a small window of time, you should have all the control that you need to say, no, this does not get done on Shabbat. We have guys that do landscaping on this property and the other, for all our properties, and we tell them you can't do it on Saturday, period. Okay? It just can't, it's, that's not happening. Actually, some of you, does anybody, were any of you at the Mount Lake Ranch years ago when I made them stop the work at the ranch because it was Shabbat? Or was it the Holy Day? It was one of the two. No? Rabbi Tom remembers that. Okay? And I really wasn't in charge, except that the owners had left town knowing that they trusted us with their property because we'd had a long relationship with them at this point, okay? And then they had people, I was like, what is that noise? And these guys are literally ripping apart a building and doing this major renovation on this building. I said, not today. And I made them stop and threw them off the property, basically, okay? Now, was that appropriate? I think it was, because I think it was very inappropriate knowing we were coming, and they knew a year in advance we were coming, that they didn't reschedule these guys for a time where we were not going to be running an event. And it wasn't safe for people who were running around while they were doing this major stuff that they were doing to the buildings we were using. But yeah, you have to be, have control over that. Now let's deal with your specific situation, okay? If your daughter has stuff in your house, and your daughter wants to get it out of your house, and your daughter is not keeping the Sabbath, your daughter could take it out of your house. And if she wants to bring someone to help her, that's fine. If you need stuff taken out of your house that's yours, 
That can't be done on Shabbat. Find somebody to do it on another day. Well, people aren't available. Then pay somebody who's available. You can go to call any of the places, like two men in a truck or whatever. I did this in New York when I moved down to Tennessee, who you could just pay for the labor time, $20, you know. I, I think I paid, I paid like $60 an hour for three guys, okay? Okay, so they gave me three guys to just do whatever I wanted. I wanted them, basically, I was bringing my own truck down to Tennessee. I just wanted them to load the truck, okay? I didn't want the moving company to move the stuff. I said, hey, I just want you guys to take all my stuff out of the house and put it in the truck. So you can do stuff like that. But if I happen to have a family member that has a bunch of stuff in my house and they've moved out, I would tell them I'd rather you not come here on Shabbat. I mean, after all, it's your house. Why, why can't they do it on a different day? Don't make things convenient for them. Oh, but I want to get the house ready to sell. So make them come on a Sunday. I mean, it's still your house. Okay, did that help? Uh, yeah, it did. I, I heard two answers though. <laughs> look, I, I would push, I would, one. look, I'm giving you the option, but I would push for, it's my house. I don't want you doing this on yeah. Shabbat. However, it's not your stuff. And you're, you have an adult person who wants to come and get their stuff. You know, you can't really, you're not really going to be able to stop them with that either. Okay. All right. So mm -hmm. I would push for, hey, out of respect for me, I would rather you not do this on Saturday. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was my first stance. And then she was like, well, just ask your rabbi anyway. So yeah. out of respect for her, that's why I'm, I'm asking. And that's fine. So I, I heard your answer and I, I agree with you. Okay, so I'll, give you, you I'll, give you, I'll give you another example. Okay, are you done? Di was that the end, Dion? Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, good. Okay, I want to say a few more things. Shabbat shalom. Though. Shabbat shalom. Look, let's say you have a child in your house and that child is not covenanted. You can't stop them from going to work on Saturday. And you shouldn't. They're not covenanted. What you should do is make sure whatever they're doing isn't disturbing your Shabbat. Well, it disturbs me when they work. No, not your emotions. Okay? You know what? Can I, I'm going I'm to invent something. Emotions are not a garment. Stop wearing them. Okay? I kind of got people coming up to me. Well, I was in my emotions. And this up, oh, my wife was in her emotions. Or my husband was in my... Get out! Don't put it on! Don't wear it! <laughs> okay? Oh, my gosh. So I, I would tell, if I was tell, as a parent to an adult child, I would say, look, you can't do anything that's going to disturb or distract my Shabbat. So you can't play loud music. You can't be running around the house. If I'm doing Shabbat in the house and I'm watching a live stream, right? I would say, look, and you can't be bringing people over that are going to be causing and being all noisy in the kitchen. What are they going to do? This is Shabbat. So if you want to go somewhere else and do whatever you want, that's fine. Or you could be quiet in my house. I'm not forcing them to keep Shabbat. I'm going to just make sure they don't disturb mine. But like actually disturb, not just you're disturbed because you don't like what they're doing, okay? You want them to do what you want them to do. Well, that, that, they have to walk out their own salvation if you're in trembling, okay? Never forget that, okay? Any of you that struggle with boundaries, just memorize Philippians 2.12, repeat it over and over again, okay? Each person has to walk out their own salvation. You cannot walk it out for them and you cannot force them because that undermines the whole point. Making them do it undermines the plan. Do you understand that? It's important you get that. Because some of you control blues out there think that, you know, you're fixing something by making them do it. No, you're hurting the situation. You're not helping. But I'm afraid for them. Stop being afraid for them. They're not yours anymore. They've always been his. You had, them, you had them for a little while as a stewardship, and now they're his again. Okay. They're going to end up wherever they end up. That's going to be their choice. You cannot make them make the choices you want them to make. I mean, let's, let's face it. Did anybody make you make the choices when you were young? No, you made your own choices. And if anybody did, were they good choices they were making you to make? No, because those are usually abusive people that were forcing stuff on you. Nobody likes to have stuff imposed on them. That's why Abba's looking for you to covenant, which is a voluntary thing. You choose him. You choose to covenant of your own free will. This is, there's no forcing here. Of course, if we were a cult, there'd be forcing. I mean, go ask Rabbi Tom of the place he came from. Oh, they'd make you do everything. They'd check on you. They'd check on your house. They'd go through your stuff. I mean, they're just they're controlling like crazy. All right? All right, next up. And Dion, you can leave the room. Um, 
Let's see. How about uh, John? Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom, John. What's up? All right. Um, I just, I just okay, thought I, I, I thought I'd just say John because I didn't want to take a shot at messing up your last name. So. Right. No, that's cool. That's fine. I appreciate that. It's Boy B, but I appreciate that okay. very much. Um, so I have a question. Um, is it okay for me to accept overtime on Shabbat? It's through an app that's posted um, only on Shabbat. Like, for whatever reason, my job does that. So, um, so wait, wait. You're, you're accepting the overtime, but you're not doing it. You're just hitting an accept for, like, overtime later in the week? Yeah, just for, like, yeah, yeah. But you actually have to respond or you're not going to get the overtime. Yeah. So how would you be aware of this accepting thing if you were not looking where you shouldn't be looking for these things? No, oh, it's on my phone. It, it's on my phone, so it, it pops up. So, okay. So I shouldn't be accepting it. All right, I got it. I got it. Okay. All right, now I got a, I got a second question. Um, is it okay for me to work right after Shabbat? You can work. Pick a you can work as soon as the sun goes down. Okay. All right. Great. That's what I thought. But. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rabbi. I really appreciate it. Okay. Appreciate no problem, you. John. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, KD and Trent and Shonda. We'll try you one more time. See if we can get you to work out. Maybe you gotta switch devices or switch. Shabbat shalom. Devices. Shabbat shalom. Hey, that works. My question is, I seen where you talk about you do marriages on the ceremony. What about funerals? Seen in Texas. Okay, you broke up quite a bit. You said something about weddings, I think, and funerals. Are you asking if they're okay to go to on Shabbat? No, like how, as a part of MTOY, how will we do that if there was a funeral in? Okay, as far as wanting someone to run the funeral for you or in terms of attending one? Yes. Yeah, I guess you gave you two choices. Performing. Like, how do we do that now? Okay, I understand. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I love when I give people two choices and they say yes. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe they wanted both answers. All right, look. Um, if, if somebody is part of... I don't do... I don't know legally how that works. I generally don't do weddings and funerals unless you're part of the group. So if you are planning to get married, I really don't want to do your wedding unless you've counseled with me to do the wedding. Right? You should have counseled with me in, doing, in your marriage, in your dating towards marriage. Okay? I'm, not, I'm really not a, a ministry for hire guy. I don't charge to do these things. It's part of your tithes and offerings that has me be your rabbi to do these things. Of course, if you need me to fly somewhere, I'll ask you to pay for the flight. Okay, but otherwise I don't charge for the service. Okay, so it's, it's part of what I do now. So if you're part of this group and you guys down there in Texas are, okay, and there was somebody that was gonna be as a part of the body was, was going in that direction or they just passed, something happened, you know, maybe was, wasn't expected. And if the family wants me to do it, I've done a few where actually probably half the ones I've done were very mixed part of the family wanting me or not wanting me to be there, okay? I did one recently where the, the, um, the one side of the family had me do the funeral for them, the other side of the family waited in the parking lot till I was done. And then they came and did their own little funeral, okay? It happens. So really, Shonda, the thing to do would be get in touch with us, let us know more of the specifics, and we can talk about that. As far as you guys going to one, all right, there's two potential situations. One is, you're not doing that on Shabbat. Okay, don't do that on Shabbat. Look, you're going to learn a lot about your family members and how much they care about you. Okay? Because let's say you have somebody who is ill and is getting close to, like, they're, they're, they're tragically ill, right? They're going to they're pass pretty soon. You should be talking to the people that make the decision and say, hey, I want to be at mom, dad, whoever's funeral, please don't do this on Saturday, okay? So that I can be at this funeral, all right? Same thing with a wedding. Your niece or your nephew or your, your daughter, your son, whatever, just got engaged. They don't usually get married the next day, okay? They plan these things out. Tell them, please don't pick a Saturday. I want to be there. 
And then they get mad at you when they pick a Saturday anyway and you don't come and say, don't get mad at me. I said to you, if you wanted me to be there, don't pick Saturday. You clearly didn't want me to be there. So what are you mad at me for? Okay, I don't care that you didn't do it on Saturday. I, I'm disappointed I won't be there, but don't get mad at me. Okay, now, of course, if you wait till the week before the wedding and say, oh, well, you know, I just want to RSVP and say I can't come, well, that's a whole different story, okay? Maybe you only found out about the wedding like at the last minute, one of the family members, whoever it is, decides to invite you because they forgot to invite you because you're like more of a distant relative. And you say, look, I'd love to be there, but you tell, I can't do it on a Saturday. I've gone to family events where I didn't go to part of it until it was after sundown. I have, a, I have a, a, a niece, well, no, my cousin, I don't know, whatever it is, my cousin's daughter. So it's not really a niece, right? It's like a, she's like a second cousin, whatever, removed, whatever, whatever, all right? So my cousin's daughter got bought, bought mitzvahed. Stephen was a baby in a, in a little stroller, and, and my wife and I went, wanted, we were invited to go to the bar mitzvah, I mean the bat mitzvah. Now, can you go to a bat mitzvah? Sure. They're having basically a, a, a Shabbat service. The only difference is the kid, a 13-year-old, is running the service. Nothing wrong with that. You could do that on Shabbat. Here's the problem. Immediately afterwards, they have a party in a lot of places. So my wife and I said, we'll come back after sundown and join the party. So we went to the bat mitzvah. Then we went back to the hotel and we continued and finished Shabbat. And then we went after sundown to the party, okay? So same thing with a wedding. If the wedding's happening on Saturday, but they're gonna be doing it late enough in the afternoon that you could go at least to the celebration afterwards, all right, so you missed the ceremony, but you could show up, you know, provided you're somewhere near where the event is happening, but you're just not gonna go there during Shabbat, okay? All right, so hopefully that made sense. Same thing with funerals, okay? We're not doing funerals on Shabbat, you're not going to funerals on Shabbat. And if the funeral is going to be in a church with very, you know, Catholic or Protestant, whatever stuff going on that you don't want to be a part of, tell them, hey, I'll meet you afterwards, after the you know, service. Because really what the funeral is about is comforting those who are mourning the loss. Okay? So usually they plan like some sort of a get together to eat afterwards. Or they're going to eat right there at the funeral home and have a little room for them to do that. And you meet with everybody. Or you go back and meet them at the house. Or if they're going to have a graveside service, you can just meet them by the graveside, which has a lot less of the stuff that you don't want to be involved in. Okay? Than sitting in a church with giant crosses everywhere, whatever it is. Okay? So make a judgment call on your own. Now, I never said you can't do this. I said, make a judgment call on your own how comfortable you're gonna feel in that building. And if you're actually mourning the loss also, is that gonna be some place you wanna be dealing with that? There may be just too many elements happening at the same time that's gonna be hard to deal with, okay? Because I'm not going in there otherwise, all right? Okay, you can certainly offer all the comfort you want after that's over, okay? All right, so hopefully they answered that question. All right, what are we on time? We got a few more we can squeeze in here. And there's nobody else on here. So uh, Rob, do you have some from the live stream over there? Okay, f from Sandy Williams, as Rabbi <coughs> gets to live stream, where, who were the sons of Elohim in Job 2, verse 1? <laughs> let's, let's not deal with those, those things. These are those things where we start getting into some of the, the odd eschatology things and stuff like that. So you're talking about Job 2? Let me, get to, let me get to Job real quick here. All right, so again, the day came to be that the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them to present himself before Yahweh. So, so <laughs> the sons of Elohim he's talking about here would be the Malachim, the angels, the, the messengers, the servants. And Satan amongst them was also a servant of sorts, okay? Okay, let's try and get Annabelle on here. By the way, for all of you to know, this is, Annabelle is kind of the Odessa version of like Janet. <laughs> she's, oh, she's always got lots of questions. Okay. So Isaiah 55, two, <clears throat> I, was, I was looking at that, you know, and I was wondering is, could I connect that with like reevaluating what I value? And then I got a couple more questions. Yeah, that would be good. I mean, look, the, okay, so the verse reads like this. It says, 
Um, why do you weigh out silver for what is not bread and your labor for what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and let your being delight in itself, itself in the fatness. All right, so look, um, it, it is, it is a, a perspective shift that's being asked for here. In other words, why, Yeshua says the same thing, like why are you putting, you know, storing up your treasure on earth instead of storing your treasure up in heaven, so to speak? You're putting your effort into the wrong things. So yeah, it's definitely for that. Okay. Can I get another one? Yep. Okay. Um, I have a question on, do you have a teaching that talks about being blameless? Uh, the Be Set Apart one probably has a little bit on that, or maybe a good chunk. I don't have one specifically on being blameless. Will you no. be doing one soon? <laughs> Would I what? Will you be doing one soon? Will I be doing one soon? Soon is a very relative question. I've got probably 40 more parts to do with this trustworthy and servant thing. So, you know, so we got only, we got 11 parts in pretty much for just the good part. And I got two more parts to deal with. So it's going to take a little while. But no, I'm not planning to do it soon, but I can make note of it so that maybe something we'll talk about. Okay. Okay. Um, and on fasting, um, you know, when we were back in a Christian walk, they would just say, you know, abstain from whatever you want. Uh, fasting is literally not eating, not drinking anything, right? No, I mean, you can do different types of fasting, okay? Um, there's water fasting, Okay, I mean, I'm not going to take it into like, um, um, well, I, look, it's, it's, it's basically abstaining from something. So I guess you could kind of use it as the metaphor, like I could do media fasting or I could fast from my phone, I can fast from different things, right? So yeah, certainly you could do yeah. that. The idea is taking a break from something. The one fast that's no water, no food, no nothing, that's the one for Yom Kippur, all right? Okay, all the, re all the rest of the fast that you do, you could do it lots of different ways. I mean, I've done no food, no water. I've done that for a couple of days. And it was a great fast, all right? Don't recommend it to everybody, but it's a great fast. You'd be surprised if you can handle it better than you think. Um, matter of fact, I think I did better with the no nothing, better than I did the water only. But I think the water only kept making me more hungry. Okay, because I was at least putting something in my body. But if you're going to fast more than just a day, you should really do research on it and have somebody monitoring you, especially if you have any health issues or you're older and you don't, you don't know what you're doing because you are going to put strain on your system, okay, when you're fasting because now it's still going, your body is still going to eat. It's just going to take whatever's in your system to eat it. This, you know, it's going to burn fat. It's going to take whatever leftover junk that's in your system and that's shifting a gear that isn't always pleasant. Sometimes you do get flu-like symptoms and other symptoms because, you know, your body's not used to going through that if you've not really fasted, okay? So just be prepared for, you know, for that kind of thing. Okay. And, like, could you explain just a little bit on blameless? When I, when I look up blameless through, through the word, I, I do see that it has a lot to do with, because where it says, be blame, blameless children in uh, front of Yahweh, so that you can be blameless children in front of Yahweh. When I look up uh, blameless, it relates a lot to righteousness. Is All that right. what makes you blameless? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's where the blameless comes from. But blameless has in it the idea that you're going to do something potentially that is something you can be blamed for. In other words, a finger can be pointed at you. So what makes you blameless? Well, you can't be blameless, period, because you're gonna mess up, right? So what does Yahweh tell us about when we mess up? He says, if you were to repent, then you will actually be as if you hadn't even done what you did. So now you're blameless. So he's saying, two, there's really two elements to this. One, make every effort not to do things that you could have a finger pointed at you, hey, you messed up. Number two, if you mess up, which you will occasionally, you need to repent of it, because then you still can maintain being blameless. But just remember, repentance is not like, rosary beads and our fathers and stuff where it's just some rote thing you think is magically fixing the problem. Repentance is owning what you did 
and committing mm -hmm. to not do it again, to try, every, uh, put all that effort into not doing it again, making the effort, okay? And so, so I'm not saying repentance is just, hey, like you mess up, good, just say a few words and it fixes it. No, meaning what you say and putting the effort in is what's gonna make the difference, all right? Anybody can say they believe, but do your actions back it up? Anybody can say they repented, but do your actions back it up? Anybody can say they forgave, but do, do, do the actions back it up? Okay? Because you keep telling me how bitter and hurt you are about something, but then you say you forgave them, you didn't. Or you would not be bitter and angry anymore. All right? So look at the fruit that way. So blameless is a state you can only get in from doing two things, making the effort, which means they... Some things, once you start making the effort, you're not going to ever mess them up again. Right? You're just going to be good at those. Other things are going to trip you up a little bit. And so how do you handle that? That's how you get to be blameless. Because you repent of it. Okay? Does that help? Yes. All right, good. Thank, Thank you. you, MTY Odessa. All right. Grandpa Bowtie. I, I knew you were going to do that. I knew you were going to do that. I thought there was, there was this slight glimmer of hope. No, nah, he won't go there, but... No, he did. All right. So wait, wait. About, I'm, I'm uh, trying. I'm trying to figure out how this worked out. So you were physically in the building, which makes you wait for next month. But now you've left the building, and now you're on the stream trying to do that. But I'm hmm. actually on the. I am not. I am in my house in Cleveland, Georgia, which is the not as good Cleveland. Um, I, I know you're at home now, but it's just, it's just so funny because I said it's not for the locals, and you literally were here a few hours ago. All right. But I'm, I'm technically not a local. Okay. No, you are. You're okay. I'm just teasing you. Okay. All right. And so, if you were here, I'd give you a tweak of the bow tie. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I'll wear a different one next week, and you can tweak it if you wish. Good. All right. Uh, what's your question? Rabbi, you've, you've often spoken um, about us not getting involved uh, vocally, politically in issues and stuff. And th there's a quote I've got that I, I want to address. I want to know what you think about it. It's by a guy who was a Lutheran minister who ended up in Auschwitz or Dachau or one of the camps. And I'm sure you're familiar with the quote, but it says, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. But my question is, isn't there a time when it's right for us to, to speak out and let our voice be heard about uh, things that are happening in society or with the, our government or stuff like that? Isn't it time for, to do that where it's appropriate? All right. So here's the problem. The problem is you quoted the, uh, the gentleman correctly. You misquoted me, okay? I've never said you can't or shouldn't speak out. I said you have to keep your emotions from believing that somehow if we fix this thing in our government today, it actually fixes anything. Ultimately, it's not gonna fix. I didn't say just lay o roll over and let them step all over you, all right? So that's the difference, okay? I, I've had, I'll have people, listen, you hear the rhetoric listening to the news stations. This is the most important election of all time. Of course, they said that last time too and the time before that and whatever. And, and it, it isn't, it isn't, okay? No matter what happens, we're either gonna end up in a period of relative prosperity and calm, relative, or things will be relatively not as calm and prosperous. And then it'll kind of keep roller coastering until eventually it really gets terrible and Yeshua shows up. So, no, I, I don't think that us, I don't want you to buy into somehow we can fix this. That's really, I guess, the word we're looking for. Okay, don't buy into the lie that we can fix this. We can't fix this. That's what he tells us. We can try what we want, but man really doesn't want to fix it, so it's not going to fix. Okay? Okay. You're just basically going to be, you know, Don Quixote's til tilting at windmills. I mean, you're not, you're really not going to fix it. However... You can speak up and should speak up if you can make a difference over a short period of time, especially in a smaller arena, maybe locally where you are in your town or your state or whatever. So I'm not against people trying to make some difference short term. I will vote this November, and I'm gonna vote for the person I think will give me 
and my family and the things I'm doing the best shot at having a relative calm for a longer period of time before it all goes to whatever, okay? Because we know it will eventually go that way. All right? And I also pray, Abba, I know this is all coming in eventually, but I'd like it to be delayed as much as it can. I got more things I need to do to get people ready for, for, for that coming, right? For, I just think I need more time to do some of the things I need to do. Not need to do for me, but you know, for the body and stuff. So, no, I agree with the quote. We should speak up. Don't be a doormat. I think we should speak up. I think people should make every effort they can. Stop, but don't buy into somehow what we do in the bigger picture things actually matters. Because in the big picture things, they're going to come for everybody. No matter whether we stood up for it or not. Okay? So it's, I'm really trying to protect your emotion and your mind for thinking, well, we could fix this. Like the lady that left, but the lady that wanted us to pray, you know, that Abba would take the evil out of Putin and this one and that one and all these different, you know, you know uh, leaders of the world. He's not going to do it. Okay? Because he's allowing this to play out and it's only going to get worse eventually. Okay? But if we can, you know, if I see a clear choice between two presidential candidates, or if I'm in my state, maybe two senatorial candidates or whatever, and I think that the one candidate might make things a little better for the short period of time they're there, I will certainly vote for the person I think might do that. However, I'm not going to have one thought that that fixes anything ultimately. It might be a nicer Band-Aid that helps us get along for a little window of time. Okay? All right? Because I've been under, at this point, you're, 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 you're old enough and I'm old enough to tell you, we've been under enough different presidents. And you know what? Life was better under some and not as good under others. But it wasn't like the one who made it better prevented it from getting worse with the next one. Or the one that made it worse it didn't prevent it from becoming better with the next one. And it's only a four or eight year cycle. It's not a long cycle. Okay? So it doesn't matter when we look back and go, so-and-so was a great president. But that was only good for the years they were there and maybe a few years after. Then it eventually, you know, the new ones affect things. So, and it, it's an up and down, up and down. I mean, you know, yeah, things can get better and things can get worse and things can get better and things can get worse. So please, all of you, speak out if you have opportunity. Speak out doesn't mean mock whoever's in charge. Do something that really actually has a chance of being effective. You have an issue with something, call your, whoever the person is you need to call. The senator, the congressman, the local, what, talk to someone that actually has the ability to make the difference. Okay, don't just, you know, put a mocking Facebook post. I ain't gonna do anything. Except have all the people that agree with you just kind of go thumbs up and love hearts and all this nonsense. Which changes nothing. Makes you feel like, you know, just makes you feel good. All right, did that help, Pete? Yes, uh, thank, and I apologize for having the wrong impression on what your uh, uh, guidance had been before. Good, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because I want to make sure nobody gets confused with that, okay? Okay. I watch people, this happens on a regular basis, not lately, but it's happened to me a lot of times in, 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 my la in the last 40 years or so with, when I've been voting, you know, where people would come up to me and be like, yeah, this is, you know, <laughs> there's no election that's that important. It's important for short term. I'm not disagreeing, because it, you know, it can certainly make a difference short term. But long term? You know, let's put it this way. Everything that Trump put in place, Biden pretty much took away, and everything that Biden put in place, let's say Trump gets back in, he could put away. I mean, it's not like it's some long lasting forever, you know what I'm saying? They can fix things and change things very quickly. I'm not saying whether you like one or the other. I'm just saying this literally has happened in our life. Okay? And so, and with, wherever Obama put in place, Trump took it, got rid of it, right? A lot of it. Okay? And so it just kind of alternates. So are we really in that different a place necessarily than however many cycles ago? Not really. Okay? The tops and the bottoms kind of are, are a channel that we've been just going in. All right? So I think like a, like a commodities or, or stock trader, and I'm looking at a chart, okay? We're in a sideways channel. The highs and the lows are not getting higher highs and lower lows. We're just kind of in this channel, all right? At some point, we're going to have a breakout to the bottom, not to the top. And then it's going to just be a race to the bottom. But we're really channeling, mostly, okay? 
And so nothing really is happening, ultimately. All right? Because let me tell all of you out there who are like 30 and younger, okay? Who are like, oh my gosh, interest rates are so high. Um, when I bought my first car, I paid 13.9% interest on the car. I don't see any cars going for that today. And I got really mad because like six months later is when they decided to start the 0.9%. And I was like, you know. Okay, life under Volcker. Volcker was the Fed chair. Oh my gosh. Raise rates, raise rates, raise rates. So you guys are all upset. Oh, inflation is so high. Really? Gas prices, at least there's gas. I, you didn't have to get in line for gas. Any of you have to get in line for gas? I mean, when I say in line, I mean like you have to wait and you can only go on the days that you're odd and even license plate days, okay? And then you'd run out of gas because the line was so long, by the time you got to the pump, you couldn't even get to the pump, all right? I mean, you guys, it's been much worse in some ways and much better in other times. Your perspective is very small. See, you know what makes Yahweh so much harder for us to understand? Because his perspective is infinite. He already knows the beginning, and he already knows the end. We got this tiny little experience of 30, 40 years, 60 years, whatever it is. That, you know, because I'm not going to count the first 15 or 20, right, when we're just dumb and we don't know anything, okay? And by the way, for all you teenagers and even 20-something-year-olds, please stop talking down to all of us older people as if you're so smart, because I can promise you, you don't know what you don't know yet. Okay? You just don't. Oh, yeah, whatever. All right, well, that's fine. All right? But you don't know what you don't know. That's part of what happens later in life, is you realize how much you don't know. Okay? And so I'm trying to give you guys a perspective. So I really appreciate the question, Pete, because the question helps you understand. I remember when times were much worse and harder economically than they are now. Okay? I mean, much worse. And by the way, people weren't able to buy meat. They couldn't afford it. People weren't, I mean, it was just not, you know, there were so many things that were just tougher to do. And then, you know, the economy got better, then it got worse, then it got better. And so it's, it's, a, it's a perspective thing. All right, perspective thing. All right, so that's going to do it for the questions. Thank you, Pete, for being the last one. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> An excellent zone one. Yeah.